Acts chapter 16, uh, verses 11 to 15. This is God's word. I pray that we would attend to it and that God would open our hearts that we might respond to it as well. From Troas, verse 11, we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace and the next day on to Neapolis. From there we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony and the leading city of that district of Macedonia, and we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and her, the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we, we do thank you for your word, which is true. We thank you for inspiring Luke uh, to record uh, select incidents in the life and ministry of your apostle Paul. Uh, we thank you, Lord, that our confidence is not in the messenger, but in the message and how you use it. And so today, Lord, our confidence is in you as we look to you for help, as we look to you to speak to us through your word by the power of the Spirit. Open, please, our eyes, our ears, our minds, but open most especially our hearts, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, if we understand uh, what this uh, context is, it will help us. So let me just ask you, please, to look back up at the verses immediately preceding, verses 6 uh, to 10, to remind us of what we glanced at last time. Paul and his companions have been traveling, and the Lord has, as it were, hedged hedged up their way. I don't know how many of you have been, ever been to England, uh, and if you've been to England and driven on any of the backcountry roads, you'll know that there are hedges that are higher than a person's head, and they're very close to the road. And their roads are kind of narrow and windy, and so uh, as you're going, you feel very closed in, and you're not quite sure what's going to come around the corner, and if you'll both fit at times. But the Lord hedged in Paul and Silas in a way to frustrate their plans. They had wanted to go to Asia. They had wanted to go to Bithynia. And the Lord had said in some way, no, don't go that way. And so the Lord brings them as they continue to move forward. Notice that even though the Lord has frustrated their plans, they don't sit still. They don't just give up and say, okay, God, well, I can't figure this out. Obviously, I'm not smart enough to know what you want me to do, so forget it all. They didn't give up throwing their bags and say, forget it, we're going back. Nor did they just sit there and say, okay, Lord, you're going to have to make it so plain to me that you're going to have to get me up off my behind and, and, and move. No, they kept moving as far as the Lord allowed them, and so they went through Mysia and were at Troas. In verse 9, we, we read this, during the night, Paul had a vision. The Lord spoke in those days and those in different ways than he typically speaks to us now and here to the apostle Paul on this missionary journey. God gives him a vision, and what is the vision? The vision is of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to us, come over to Macedonia, and help us. Now, the first thing then as we move into the, our text for this morning is that God opened the way. God opened the way to bring them to Philippi. God led them, directed them through this vision of a man from Macedonia. And if you know your ancient or classical history, you'll know that this uh, Roman colony was not always a Roman colony. This was uh, Philip uh, II of Macedon uh, that the city is named after, who was the father of Alexander the Great. He had his own empire. And yet, some 200 years before, this area had been incorporated into the Roman Empire, and the Romans considered the Macedonians barbarians, except for the royal family, of course. But the rest of the people were barbarians. No reason particularly for Paul and Silas to want to cross the Aegean Sea and enter into what we now know as Europe. 
No reason to take, uh, for, from a human perspective, to take the gospel to those barbarians. Are they going to understand? After all, the gospel is, uh, has a rich history of the Old Testament that they'll have to understand and know before they can really embrace Jesus as their Lord and Savior, right? Doesn't it take too much time, too much effort to go to them? Let's stay in uh, minor Asia, Asia Minor. Let's stay in Ephesus and Antioch. Let's stay in Jerusalem and Judea. No, the Lord pushes them forward, calling out to them, helping them to understand that many, all, need the gospel. For this is what this cry was. Come over to Macedonia and help us was not a cry for, to help with the infrastructure of their society, although that's good and necessary at times. It wasn't a cry for more medical assistance or better education or uh, micro enterprises, although those are all good things. Come help us in scripture is a cry for salvation, a cry for deliverance. And what God is showing to Paul and his companions is that even the Macedonians, those barbarians need the gospel. And so too today, right? This is the mission of the church. It's not necessarily the individual ministry of every particular member of the church. You have been gifted by God with certain gifts, talents, abilities, passions, and you are to use each one of those for God's glory and for the good of others. Each one of those gifts, whether it's in information technology or whether it's in teaching or whether it's an electrician or an ophthalmologist or whatever it is, is to be used to spread the gospel. You can go and pave the way, as it were. You are to be looking for opportunities to use your particular gifts so that the gospel will gain a greater hearing. But we cannot forget that what people need at a soul level, what, what people's greatest need is, is an eternal need of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So as you go and dig wells, or as you go and help set up schools, or as you go and work in various activities and endeavors, take the gospel. Now, it's not just overseas, is it? You can take the gospel to work with you. You can take the gospel. It's not just a matter of speaking the truth, but it's how you live. It's what you do and why you do the things you do. All those things are important, but what we see here is that God opens the way for them to go to Macedonia. And look at the final verse there, after verse 10. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once. Their obedience was immediate. They didn't wait and, and hesitate and wonder and, and, and wring their hands and say, well, you know, uh, they didn't set out a fleece <laughs> like Gideon did. They didn't say, well, Lord, you're going to have to show me too. No, the companions, Paul, Silas, Luke, Timothy, those who were with him concluded that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. And so they got ready at once to leave. And Luke relates the sea voyage about 120 miles, a two-day trip, until finally they get to Philippi, a Roman colony. Philippi is where they ended up, and look who is there when they get there. This is God's providence. This is an example, a report of how God works in mysterious ways to bring people to the right place at the right time in his good pleasure, in his grace, to hear the gospel. They stayed in Philippi for several days, but apparently hadn't met Lydia at this point. We're not sure if they even saw any success in the preaching of the gospel. That's why they went there, but we're not given any details about those first several days. But the, on the Sabbath, when we're assuming that this is the first Sabbath after their arrival, on the Sabbath, they go outside to the, of the city gate to the river where they expected to find a place of prayer. Paul's pattern was to go to the synagogue to go to the Jews first and then to take the message of the gospel of grace through faith in Jesus Christ to the Gentiles too. He was an apostle to the Gentiles, but he went to the Jews first. And so he's looking here for a gathering, looking for what some have called a bridgehead, looking for a place to begin. And he finds it down by the riverside where women are gathered to pray. Now, older records indicate that a synagogue needed 10 men to start 
in any particular city, 10 Jewish males were needed to begin a synagogue. We're not told explicitly that this is a synagogue, and the record that Luke gives us does not mention men at all. Was it such a small Jewish community that there weren't enough Jewish men who were there willing and ready to worship God on his day? Or were they busy doing other things, you men? We find it easy, don't we, to be busy doing other things. We're not told we, we can't judge their hearts from this time and place, but we do know that it was praiseworthy for those women to be there. We thank God that women often are faithful in the Lord's work. And here, we see the, the apostle and the rest of the mission team. We're assuming Silas was with him, Timothy, a young man he brought along with him, Luke as well, uh, that they're with Paul. And as they sat down, we sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. The gospel makes no distinction, does it? It's no, neither male nor female, neither slave nor free, Paul will say in Galatians. All need Christ, and Christ is offered freely to all. And this is a principle we must get if we are to follow what Christ wants us to do. We sat down and we began to speak to the women who had gathered there, not about the weather, not about the favorite gladiator in Philippi or Olympic athlete, not about the things of this world, they were called to preach the gospel, verse 10. That's what God had called them to do in Macedonia, and that's what they did. When they began to speak to the women, they were no doubt speaking about Jesus, the fulfillment of all the promises of God's salvation. They were speaking of the one who had come in the fullness of time, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem and save all who were under the law by becoming a curse in our place. They began to speak to the women who had gathered there. And here we see the second thing, that not only God, does God open the way, but God opens hearts. One of those listening was a woman named Lydia. God knows this. God knows her. Isn't it amazing to know, to think, that the creator of the universe, that the God of heaven and earth knows our names? Now, Luke's record is selective. He doesn't name anyone in her household, even though they were all baptized. He doesn't give all the details of all the people that Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke spoke to or responded, even responded to the gospel. But here we see that God does know the details. That God knows who she is and what she's done and where she's from. And those details are important, important to him, and they should be important to us. So let me just pause here and ask as a matter of application, how well do you know the people around you? Now, we can certainly look around the, the rows and see how well we think we know the people around you, and I hope you know your grandson very well. Uh, but we, I'm not talking about that so much as the people that we work with, our neighbors, the people that we run into day after day or even just regularly. I don't know, maybe you go to the same barber shop at the same time every month and you see the same barber and you see others who come the same time. Do you know anything about them or are we so wrapped up in this little world on the seven inch screen that we don't lift up our eyes and see? Well, what did Luke record about this woman? He records that her name, first of all, that she was named Lydia, and he records where she was from as well as what she did. Uh, one of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a merchant. She was a working woman. She was a, a, a representative, perhaps, of a, a, a manufacturer uh, back in her hometown of Theratira, but she was at least in business here in Philippi. Well, this is a wonderful thing uh, to talk about on Labor Day weekend, isn't it? She was a worker. She was a worker. 
And so should we be. We should have, maybe it's not outside the home, maybe it is, but we should have uh, something that we are doing. And Lydia did, and this dealer in purple cloth, uh, purple cloth was typically very expensive, not exclusively limited to royalty, but typically hard to come by, a sign of wealth and privilege. And the merchants who sold purple cloth were often themselves wealthy individuals. And so we believe Lydia was a woman of great substance and means, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira. Now, just one comment about that city that she hails from. God does know our names and knows where we came from, but you might not know where this particular city is located. It's located in the region that God did not allow Paul and Silas to minister to. Isn't this amazing? They want to go to Asia, southwest. They want to go north to Bithynia. They are forced in God's providence, by God's direction, to cross and go into Macedonia. And the first person that we have them preaching the gospel to is from a place that they couldn't have gone, they didn't go themselves, and a woman no less. And it's a wonderful thing to see God's providence. And you wonder if he's up there smiling when, when he hedges up Paul's way and Silas and is saying, oh Lord, why can't we go there? And God is just saying, just you wait, just you wait. Well, oftentimes God works like this in our own lives that we can only see by hindsight. But God was working here in this life too providentially. She was a worshiper of God. This language is most often used for pagans who come to a faith in the Jewish religion but haven't fully incorporated and become Jewish themselves. But she was a worshiper and she was there. By God's providence, she was there at the right place at the right time to listen to Paul preach the gospel. And that's important. Notice how Luke records it. She was not only a worshiper of God, but she was listening to Paul speak. Now, how many of us sit through uh, so many sermons, and yet when, you're, when, we at, when we ask ourselves, let alone have someone else ask, well, what did you, what did the preacher say? What was the sermon today? We, we say, well, hmm, I, I don't know. <laughs> now, it's bad enough when the preacher does that, but when we are here to listen and we just don't, well, that's on us. But Lydia was listening. She was a listener. And we know from Jesus' own lips that there is a difference between people who just hear things and people who listen to things and heed them. We can do a lot of hearing, but we don't really listen to what's said. And we don't respond. But by the grace of God, she not only listened but responded. And it was because the Lord worked in her heart. Verse 14 is so important. The Lord opened her heart to respond. The first thing we understand from this is that our hearts are naturally closed. Otherwise, it wouldn't be, make any sense to say that the Lord opened it. Now, even the youngest here among us can understand that when you know, a door is closed and you want to get through it, you need to open it. And if it's locked, you need a key. Well, here it's said that the Lord opened Lydia's heart. God alone, the maker of the heart, is the, is the one who can open it. He's the one who can remake it, as it were. He can give it new life. He can give us ears to hear when naturally the things of God are, are foreign to us and alien to us, and we don't want anything to do with it. God can change our hearts, and that's what he did. And when it talks about the Lord opening her heart, it's talking about the Lord working new life in her innermost being that her understanding was changed. It's what we pray for God to illuminate the scriptures because we do not naturally understand the things of God. In fact, we're, we're his enemies. And, and naturally our ears are shut up and our minds are darkened to the things of God. But God in his providence and in his grace and in his sovereignty can make us understand eternal realities, make us understand the gospel, understand who Jesus is and what he's done. But it's not just our understanding. When it says that the Lord opened her heart, notice he opened her heart to respond to the word. Our will is involved in the Lord opening our hearts. 
Naturally, we're very selfish and self-centered, and we want to do what we want to do, and the Lord changes that. The Lord changes it to be Godward, and, and the decisions we make to reflect that. And it's not just the understanding and the will, but it's the affections as well. I, I hope, I, was, I had the, the joy of, of visiting Justin and Liz uh, Sweeney and sit, seeing little baby Adeline uh, the other day, and uh, apparently in the evenings, she gets a little grumpy. <laughs> now, I don't know why. I hope it wasn't because I was there, but uh, it was beautiful to see Justin as a new father uh, speaking in little, uh, you know, baby language and those uh, lilting tones to his daughter saying, oh, don't be a grump. Oh, don't be a grump. <laughs> you know, as he's bouncing her up and down. And, and you could just picture her in, in your mind's eye, I know, see her little lips start to go out and her, her brow pucker up and all those things. But this is a, the, these are the affections being expressed in an infant. But you have affections too, and yet most of us, when we think of our conversion, we don't often think of our affections being changed. But when the Lord opens Lydia's heart, it wasn't just her understanding to embrace something she didn't know or understand before. It wasn't just that she was ignorant, but it was her will to respond in faith and repentance to what Paul's message was, to the gospel message. And it wasn't just her will to respond and say yes, but it was her affections that were changed too. That's why the image of the heart is so expressive, because we know that our affections are part of who we are and part of what God wants from us. And by his grace, he opened her heart and she responded to the word. Lord, teach us patience with others because only you can, can change a heart. And so often I'm impatient with people because they're not getting it. They're not responding the right way. And in my impatience, I begin to sin I become more and more irritated with them and, the, and fewer and fewer things that they say or do are acceptable to me. I start to look at them with a lack of charity and grace in my eyes and, and soon nothing they can do is right because they're not doing what I think they should be doing. Lord, give me patience because only you can change the heart. What a prayer for you as parents and grandparents and Sunday school teachers and, and just individuals who interact with others only the Lord can change hearts, but the Lord does change hearts. And there is our hope. Our hope is in the Lord, for salvation is of the Lord. And notice that she gives attention to the word preached. She responds not just to the impulses of her own heart or to what she thinks in her own imagination, but she responds in faith and repentance to Paul's message. She responds to the gospel. Richard Sibbs, a Puritan preacher, has a, a, a sermon on this text, and at, toward the end of it, he says, how many sermons are lost because we do not cultivate the power to retain the seed of God's word? What we hear is soon gone and of no benefit. The Lord opened her heart to respond to the preaching of the gospel. That can't be just my prayer for you. That has to be your prayer too. That when you come to church on Sundays, God would open your heart to respond to the message. I won't always get it right, say it most eloquently or beautifully or have the best illustrations or perhaps some sermons, any illustrations. But by God's grace, for his glory and by his power, his, he, he can open your heart too to respond to the message of the gospel. And as we respond to the message of the gospel, there will be two consequences. And this is the conclusion. Two consequences of Lydia's conversion. Number one is obedience to the Lord. And number two is love for the saints. Look at verse 15 when she and the members of her household were baptized. Well, obviously this wasn't just a bare presentation of the gospel where she was converted and then sent home. 
There was some discipleship, some further instruction that goes along here because her whole household now is being baptized in obedience to Christ's command. Go to the ends of the earth, making disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lo, I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. She is obedient to the Lord's command to be baptized. And not because it was tradition. This is part of the beauty of Acts. It's a missionary book. And so you're, you're, you're seeing the, the gospel go to places where it hasn't gone before. And Jesus Christ being believed by adults and children and so on that have never heard the gospel before. And so she and her whole household were baptized in obedience to God. Not because they'd always done it that way. Not because it was expected. But because the Lord commanded it. Because this is the sign of the covenant that shall be placed on all who believe in Jesus Christ and their children. The promise is for you and your children, Peter says at Pentecost. Because now they are a home in which the Lord Jesus is worshipped. There was obedience. It's the first consequence and evidence of con true conversion. And so I ask you, do you have this evidence in your own lives? Do you know what God requires of man and women and boys and girls? Do you know the way that you should live? Do you know that he wants you to repent and be baptized, to ex exercise faith and to attend to the assembly of the saints on Sundays and to be part of a church and so on and so forth? Where is the evidence of obedience in, in your life? The second thing is love. The second evidence of a genuine conversion or consequence of it is love. Love for God and love for the saints. When, her, when the Lord opened her heart, she opened her home. I'm not, that's not original with me, but it's beautifully expressed, isn't it? When the Lord opened her heart, she opened her home. What have you opened to others? How are you a blessing to them? To the other believers in our own congregation and to the other saints around you? Now, I'm not talking about entertaining. I'm talking about biblical hospitality. Biblical hospitality lets people in even when things aren't all right. When everything hasn't been vacuumed and dusted and washed and put away. And, you know, our homes are not museums. Our homes are meant to be lived in. But as we live in them and we love others, we'll invite others to live alongside of us, to come and enjoy the fellowship and company of the saints. And she was persuasive. She didn't, she insisted. And I think you know some people who are like that too, don't you? They're very good at persuading you to accept something from them. Praise the Lord for generous people who have gifts that they're willing to give and share with others. But be, be please, be, be those who not only give generously, but also receive graciously. When somebody wants to bless you, receive that blessing with thanks to God and thanks to them, and then pass it on to others as well. Well, if we, if we are truly converted, if the Lord has truly opened our heart, it will be evident in our obedience to God and our love for others, but there's one final point of application we must understand, and that is God has opened up a way for you too. If he has opened your heart then he will open a way for you to be obedient to him. So where is your way leading you? Where do you find yourself where, where you are around unbelievers? Where is a, a gathering place where you can have, build a bridgehead, as it were, to speak the gospel? Where, where are there, is there opportunity for you to sit with someone else and talk to them? Maybe it is at the bus stop, even though you're probably not sitting at the bus stop. Maybe it is at your barber shop. Maybe it's at your local coffee shop or a restaurant that you go to every single week without fail. As long as you can make it there, you'll be there. Are we using that opportunity to speak the gospel, not just to one another, but to others? Are we inviting them into the conversation and saying, listen, we've got a message which we want you to hear? You know, Edie Brown's funeral was this past Thursday. A beautiful sister in Christ whose death was very unexpected and sudden. But as I was able to sit with her four daughters, 
the brown girls and talk to them about their mom. The thing that came across so clearly time and time and time again in those hours that they were reminiscing and recollecting memories and laughing and crying about their mom. The thing that came through loud and clear was that Edie loved Jesus and she loved others. And she wanted others to love Jesus too. As we remember our sister in Christ, let us pray that God would allow us to imitate her virtues, to be more like her as she was like Christ. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this record of Lydia's conversion, for acknowledging uh, that you are the one who takes the initiative, you are the one who opens the heart and allows us to respond. And Father, I pray that there would be a response even to this message today, that the gospel would be understood, that there is a, a, there is a way of salvation, there, there is forgiveness of, th of sins, there is the removal, removal of guilt and the, and the removal of the fear of death through faith in Jesus Christ. So Father, we pray that the Holy Spirit who does open hearts would keep our hearts open too, so that we would retain the gospel and that you would change us because of it. We ask all this in Jesus' name, amen. If you knew Edie better than I did, you knew her voice was used to the glory of God, and so it is now in heaven. And we've been there 10,000 years. What a glory that will be, but the heaven, the realities of heaven and the joys of heaven are only for those who respond in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ. So put your trust in Jesus today. Don't wait, for no one knows what tomorrow brings. Receive now God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.